1997, a special interest group called the Project for a New American Century was formed. I have four letters in our possession which you can get on the website that state the aim and the principle of this project for the new American century. The signers of this project were men and women who are now known as neoconservatives. A letter was sent to President William Clinton January the 26th, 1998 from this project for the new American century. In this letter, these neoconservatives were telling President Clinton that he must attack Iraq and remove Saddam Hussein. It, you should get this because it outlines exactly what was offered to President Clinton that he rejected. Now listen, who are the signers of this? Elliot Abrams, Richard Armitage, William Bennett, Jeffrey Bergner, John Bolton, Paula Dobriansky, Francis Fukuyama, Robert Kagan, Zalme Khalilzad, William Crystal, Richard Pearl, Peter Rana, Rana, Rodman, Donald Rumsfeld, William Schneider, Vin Weber, Paul Wood Wolfowitz, R. James Woolsey, and Robert B. Zolek. But in the original aim uh, letter of this uh, group, Jeb Bush was a part of it. These are called the neocons or the neoconservatives. Well, after President Clinton rejected this, these neoconservatives sent a letter to Newt Gingrich, who was then the Speaker of the House, and to Senator Trent Lott. But in this, they criticized President Clinton for failing to adhere to their counsel. And if you will get this, you can get it from the website, you will see the lineup of what they said to the congressional leaders that ultimately became the policy of President George W. Bush. After 9-11, they wrote a letter to President Bush. But President Bush had already signed on to these policies before he entered office, listen to me good, before he entered the office of the presidency of the United States, George W. Bush was committed to regime change in Iraq. Now let's see if this is true. The objective of this group of neoconservatives was to reshape American foreign policy from their own statement of their principles it reads conservatives have not confidently advanced a strategic vision of America's role in the world they have not set forth guiding principles for American foreign policy, we aim to change this. Dick Cheney signed it. Jeb Bush signed it. 
Rumsfeld signed it. Paul Wolfowitz signed it. Elliot Abrams signed it. Gary Bauer. Elliot Cohen. Aaron Friedberg. Steve Forbes. Dan Quayle. Louis Libby. Norman Podhoretz. Ro uh, Peter Rodman. Stephen Rosen. Henry Rowan. Vin Weber. And George Regal. Now, some of these people were not in government at this time. They were on the outside looking in during President Clinton's administration. Some of them were, however, with the father, George Bush, Herbert Walker Bush. Now, when President Bush became the president, <clears throat> Many of these people came into government. Dick Cheney, Vice President of the United States, Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Douglas, Douglas Feith, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Richard Armitage, Deputy Secretary of State, John Bolton, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and Security, Louis Scooter Libby, Chief of Staff and National Security Advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney, Richard Pearl, former Chairman of the Defense Policy Board at the Pentagon. And it's interesting that he had a nickname titled the Prince of Darkness. Now, these neoconservatives had in mind the destruction of Iraq. Now, if you understand, they thought that their idea was the right idea for the time, but every idea needs a vessel that will bring that idea to fruition. So the neoconservatives were shopping around for the right vessel. And they found that vessel in George W. Bush. When you read the book, written about Paul O'Neill. That book was correct when he said President Bush came into office with a predisposition to remove Saddam Hussein. I said it to the president first. Now out of his administration are coming witness bearers of the rightness of what I wrote to him. Please listen. Richard Clark, in his book, Against All Enemies, wrote, President Bush was preoccupied with Iraq and was not focused on the war on terror. Thus, it becomes clear why President Bush asked after 9-11, was there a tie between Iraq and Al-Qaeda? And even though the best information from the intelligence community said there was no link. According to Richard Clark, President Bush continued to urge them to find the link. Why find a link? Because the aim was to destroy the regime of Saddam Hussein. Early on in the president's administration, he said, my administration is committed to regime change in Iraq. I believe that President Bush did not know of 9-11 in advance. However, had he not been so preoccupied with the neoconservative idea on Iraq, he might have been able to connect the dots of the many warnings that were coming to America from her friends around the world and avoid the tragedy 
of 9-11. He might have been able to direct the FBI and the CIA to bring him whatever intelligence they had that would have allowed his administration to connect the dots. Now this is just my belief. I believe that even though he didn't know, somebody knew. And those who knew, knew that if this happened, it would put President Bush and the administration in the position that would allow them to fulfill the aim of the neoconservatives. Now, you may not agree. Minister Farrakhan, do you think that anyone would be so wicked as to allow the deaths of 3,000 American and non-American citizens to pursue a political and economic object objective? 44 years ago, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me, Brother Farrakhan, you cannot fathom the depth of Satan. And those of us who can't think like that would never believe that a human being was capable of planning the deaths of innocent people to further a political and an economic objective. This happened during the Kennedy administration. When John Fitzgerald Kennedy was uh, fixed on Cuba and Fidel Castro and a communist regime 90 miles from the American shore, it is written that some of his generals came to him suggesting that an American ship be bombed in Guantanamo Bay and blamed on Cuba so that the American press could whip up the American people into a fervor for war and it would justify America in a war against Fidel Castro to remove that regime. President Clinton rejected that advice. President Kennedy, pardon me, rejected that advice. Do you remember the main the Maine was a ship in the harbor of Havana. And when someone wanted a war with Spain, the Maine was bombed in the Havana harbor, killing those on board the Maine. The press whipped it up as something that the Spanish did. Thus, the Spanish-American War was launched. Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines then came under the power and rule of the United States of America. Do you remember the Gulf of Tonkin? Another ship was supposedly involved in an altercation with a gunboat from North Vietnam. This was whipped up by the American press and President Lyndon Baines Johnson deceived the American Congress and the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was signed committing 500,000 American soldiers to that area of the world.